girls. I cannot stop reading this book. I love it so much. Okay. Show Me a Sign by Anne Claire Lazat, Chapter 30. I can talk in signs with you. I believe that's what we're doing, Ezra Brewer responds. I haven't conversed with anyone in ages, I tell him. Well, it's about time you did, he signs. I look behind us and I see the sails flying on the SS Defiance. Andrew must have been aiming to take me to his schooner, not back to Dr. Minot's. He must have left early to prepare it. The black dog is a mid-sized cutter. The rig makes the boat faster and easier to maneuver than many larger boats. We stand more than a fair chance against Andrew's schooner. Sailing into the Atlantic, the waters are choppy. Andrew is following us, I sign. We'll sail south of Boston and then around Cape Cod, signs Ezra Brewer. We'll stay on the sea to take the harder route, he winks. My stomach drops. The back of the Cape can be perilous to navigate, even with a capable captain at the helm. The Mayflower couldn't pass the Cape to sail on to the colony of Virginia. They had to land at the tip of Cape Cod. When we look back again and we see that Andrew has navigated a course straight toward us. It will take him time to catch up, Ezra Brewer assures me. We won't, want to, we won't sail into swift currents for a while. I raise my hands to sign again, but I find I have nothing to say. In Boston, I thought that if I ever saw someone from the vineyard, I would spill out all the details of my kidnapping, and now I can't bring myself to say them. Ezra Brewer glances at me, waiting to see what I'll sign. I want to say something, anything that's not about me. He shakes his head. A fool I've been. You've been wanting food and water. He gives me a hard biscuit to nibble on. We're going home now? I sign. Indeed. This whole town has been trying to find you and making prayers for your safety. Your ma and pa were hit very hard. I noticed that he keeps one eye on the helm and the other on the schooner that's following us. His left hand reaches down for a bottle. There isn't there. There isn't one there, and he scowls. I don't want them to grieve any more, I tell him. We've been hurting long enough. Ezra Brewer smiles broadly and signs. You should know that curly-headed gal has been sulking and signing all over the island. Nancy? I ask. I can't wait to embrace her again. I'm sure she's been bored without me. How is she? He signs. Doesn't help her father's carrying on about his land rights. Is Mr. Skiff persisting? I ask, shaking my head again. Ezra Brewer works his mouth and starts signing again. You can count on that. He made a mess over a piece of land just because he wanted it when he, ha when he already has enough. What sort of reason is that? I've got all I need with my boat and my cat. Ezra Brewer looks at me to make sure that I'm paying attention. I'm watching him, though I can't help but glance back to see how close Andrew is. It's hard to tell if he's gaining on us. How about Thomas Richards, I ask? Is he still working on the farm with Papa? I dare say he is, and that colt of your brother's bit of your brother's, Bayard, well, I should tell you that story. The morning that the malefactor absconded you, it means when Andrew stole her, Bayard had his hackles up. He knew something was wrong. I remember the horse was running free in the yard. Ezra Brewer continues, well, he jumped the fence and he went after you. He was so agitated that he got whipped and cut by bare branches running down the high road, and he never made it to you. He had a few deep wounds and one eye swollen shut when they found him. Oh no, I sign. I'm not trying to make you feel sorry, he signs. It's just because you mentioned Thomas. Can ye believe that he w it was that young daughter of his who helped Nurse Bayard back to health? You know how finicky horses are. They only like who they like, and you can't change their minds. He wouldn't let the Irishman near him, but he decided that the Indian gal was all right. That story made me feel glad. Sally's persistence was rewarded. How is Sarah Hellman? I ask, eager for any news of Chilmark. Do you have a fever? Ezra Brewer signs comically. Since when does that haughty chit deserve your consideration? Oh, she's not that bad, I insist, all things considering. How about Reverend Lee? Aye, he feels right sorry, Ezra Brewer signs, for bringing that villain into town under his protection. It's not his fault, I insist. I know, he signs, but like all good Christians, his conscience troubles him. 
As we continue our voyage, we pass the remnants of a boat. Ooh, a wrecked whaler, Ezra Brewer signs, removing his cap. What happened? I ask. What usually does, he replied. Whaling boats get sunk by injured whales trying to escape the harpoon. In some cases, the whale will crash its head into the hull of the boat, smashing it to splinters, causing it to sink with the terrified whalers struggling for their lives in the open sea. Does it hurt the whale? I ask. No, he signs. You take less damage hitting something on the head. I shiver, thinking of the loss of life. Ezra Brewer changes the subject. Better check the fish hook, he signs. He heads towards the stern and brings back the catch of the day. An old friend has a small an old friend has a small fish flapping in her mouth. Smithy! I exclaimed. Oh, I was like, somebody who has a fish in their mouth? Now I realize it's the cat. Where else would she be? Ezra Brewer asks. She's a regular one eyed pirate. Her treasure is of the fishy variety. Smithy walks over to greet me, fish in her mouth, belly swinging. I stroke her thick coat while she eats her catch. I know the rest of the journey will not be so jovial. Andrew Noble is pursuing us. I'm counting on my ruggish captain to vex him. Now I need sleep. The cabin's basin is chipped, but the mattress is fresh hay. I pick up a blanket. It's my quilt that Mama made me for my 10th birthday. She must have given it to Ezra Brewer with a clean nightgown and a mob cap. I hold it to my face and I inhale its familiar scent. I change clothes and snuggle into bed. Smithy keeps me warm, and the sea rocks me back and forth. I tuck the map of memories under the hay for safekeeping. Um, I think I'm going to do the next chapter also because it's pretty short. Chapter 31. We've been sailing for three days. I chart the Defiance's progress with Ezra Brewer's spyglass. We're both tense, though he shows it less than I do. Still, I feel it in his movements, the way he watches as he alternates between tasks, checking the rigging, navigating, and the deftness of the old sea hand. Though we have a lead on Andrew Noble, he's in steady pursuit. There's little for me to do, but feel as if I'm in the way. I play with Smithy for a long time, but she saunters off to attend to her own feline affairs. When evening approaches, I'm no longer able to spy the defiance with my bare eyes. I'm relieved to think Andrew's given up. To keep the chill of the winter ocean at bay, Ezra Brewer gives me his thick woolen socks. I pull them up like stockings above my knees. They're large and sag on my legs. He signs, my apologies that I have nothing fancy to match your finery. I stick my tongue out and I'm at him and he cackles. The sky looks so big when you're in the middle of the ocean on a boat. <clears throat> Tonight there are red and pink streaks stretching out for miles. I rub my eyes to stay awake for a few more minutes. Watching me, Ezra Brewer signs. Red sky at night, sailor's delight. I imagine he's speaking to more than just the weather. Let it indeed be a good omen. I sign. Mama once called you a privateer. He signs. Did she indeed? I nod. Aye, he signs. That was a long time ago. Won't you tell me? I ask. A bedtime tale told well in signs can reignite a flame of one's soul. He rubs his hands together. It was Captain Y. Miss Oric of London. That's quite a name, isn't it? His ship, the Harriet, regularly transported goods between London and Jamaica. But in March 1776, the Harriet was driven into the shoals between the vineyard and Nantucket. Captain Oric wasn't headed to Jamaica, though. He was carrying a load of provisions to the British troops in Boston. He ran aground and managed to get free then had to anchor in safe and wait for the currents to be in his favor. While he sat, word got back to Edgartown. Ezra Brewer continues, quite animated. We went out in an armed sloop and other small boats, and we demanded that Captain Oryx surrender his vessel. His Majesty's ship? I ask incredulously. More or less, Ezra Brewer signs with a rueful smile. Shots were fired. The captain was wounded. We took him and the Harriet to the Edgartown Harbor as a prize of war. They're talking about the American Revolution, if you haven't figured it out. Eventually, we released Captain Oric. We weren't cutthroats, you know. In proper apparel, mind you. Some would tell you that we stranded him without any breaches. That would be the most improper, even for a band of mutineers. I give Ezra a sidelong glance at that last statement. He concludes, We weren't commissioned to profit, was... 
We weren't commissioned, so the profit was divided among us. I can tell you it wasn't small. That ship was taken to Dartmouth. Whether Captain Oric returned to England, I do not know. I like to imagine him fat and happy in his ancestral home. Was privateering legal at that time? I ask. Not exactly, Ezra Brewer admits. The law had not yet been passed, and the letters of the Marquis or authority were not yet being issued. Privateering was done in the name of piracy and patriotism. It wound up being an asset for the War of Independence. So I guess pri privateering is like, um, kind of like a, attacking an enemy's boat and kind of like taking it over. So, because that's what I'm just, what I'm hearing. So that's what Ezra used to do in the War for Independence, which is the Revolutionary War. Do you feel guilty about what you did? I ask. Not really, he signs, brushing a cat hair off his trousers. You are a genuine scoundrel, sir, I observe. You have it, he signs. Ezra Brewer makes the sign for walking downstairs with his fingers and then pretends to fluff a pillow under his head. I smile and nod, and I follow Smithy down the wooden steps into the bunk. My mind is filled with images of priv privateers searching for treasure. Finally, I drift off like a baby in her mother's arms.